Hey class, welcome back and welcome to the beginning of chapter seven. So chapter seven is a really interesting chapter. We're gonna be talking about sort of three main topics. We're gonna be talking about center of mass, impulse and momentum. So keep in mind, once we get into talking about impulse and momentum, we're looking back now to vector quantities, things of magnitude and direction, all right? So um, yeah, make sure you're not stuck in scalar mode, which we were in for energy and work, right? Get back into vector mode as we start to look at impulse and momentum and how they affect one another. There's some really cool parallels that you'll see between um, work and energy and now impulse and momentum. Let's start with center of mass. So what the center of mass is, is as the name implies, it's the center of the mass of the object. So it's the point at which there's an even amount of mass distributed on all sides of that location. Okay, so for symmetrical objects that are homogeneous, meaning there's even density at all locations, then the center of mass is very easy to find. It's just the same as the geometric center of your object. But the center of mass for other things where you don't have uniform mass distribution are different. So for example, a fun example that one of our math professors uses is the idea of a can of soda. So as I drink this, it's not even soda, it's just flavored water, basically, but it's carbonated, it's nice. But anyway, as I drink this down with each sip, the center of mass actually decreases a little bit because there's more mass lower down when there's empty space up above. So the center of mass for my can is in the center across the top, but actually drops as I drink it lower and lower and lower until you get to the very bottom as you drink the last few sips, it actually moves back up as it approaches empty. And when it's entirely empty, it's very close to the geometric center of your object. So center of mass can really vary depending on the object and the way the mass is distributed within or around that object. But we care about paying attention to the center of mass because where it's at affects the way an object's going to move, and as you'll see in future uh, chapters, it has to do with how it's going to rotate and other things as well. So you'll hear the term center of mass and center of gravity at different times. Near Earth's surface, these two terms are pretty much interchangeable, but there is a slight difference. Okay, So the center of mass and center of gravity, as I mentioned, are interchangeable because they're at the same exact location if you're on or near Earth's surface for relatively small objects. Okay, so they're interchangeable on Earth for everyday size objects, but there is a difference. So the center of gravity is the point at which there's an even distribution of weight force on all sides of the object, force due to gravity. Okay, whereas we mentioned a minute ago, the center of mass is the point at which all mass is distributed evenly around that point. Okay. So the reason that we care about these ideas of center of mass and center of gravity is they really, again, as I mentioned before, help you describe its motion and they also help you understand how to balance a given object. An object will always be balanced or supported if its base of support, the point at which it's being supported, is under the center of mass. So like here I have a plate. And so if I put my finger under the center of mass just right, I can actually balance it on that single point. If I'm off at all, as you can see, apparently I am a lot, then it won't balance quite right. But if I get perfectly under that center of mass location, then it will kind of balance. All right, well, not an amazing demonstration, but I had a plate sitting here, so that was from breakfast. Okay, so how do we define the center of mass? Well, you can actually quantify it quite simply. The center of mass is just gonna be when you add up all the different masses and their locations, mass one times location one plus mass two times location two and so on, and divide by the total mass, that will give you the physical X location of your center of mass. So for example, here we have two different masses. Well, where's the center of mass? We know it's gonna be somewhere between those two. All right, where exactly? Well, you determine the point of the first mass relative to some axis the second mass, and then do m1 times the first position plus m2 times the second position. This dot, dot, dot just represents if there's more masses, and then divide by the total mass of your system. You could put this axis anywhere, right? You could even have it passing through mass 1, in which case x1 would be 0, and you'd still find the same solution. Okay, 
So I wanted to kind of give you some examples of this idea of base of support needing to be under the center mass, part of why we care about what the center mass is. Um, there's people, when it comes to loading airplanes, whose job it is, and this applies primarily to like cargo planes and stuff like that, but it, their job, they're known as the load master, and their job is to know where the center of mass is at all times. Because when you have an airplane that's supported by just three little wheels, you have a set base of support that's relatively small. If that center of mass shifts beyond the base of support, if that center of mass ends up too far back, then the plane is going to tip over because it's no longer going to be supported because you do not have your center of mass or center of gravity over the top of your base of support. And you see this a few different times. Here's three examples of cargo planes whose load masters probably are out of a job, okay? Um, but just kind of cool other examples. I know something that I saw a lot when I was traveling on my recent juniors abroad trips, people stacking rocks, okay? In order to stack them, the center mass of the rock on top must be directly over the point of contact between it and the rock below because, again, that's where its base of support is located. Here's a large rock. Where is its center of mass? I don't know exactly, but I know it's going to be somewhere above this portion of the rock because that's where the base of the support is. Same thing here. And then here's a video of a crane who's lifting up this steamroller out of the middle of a bunch of traffic. All right, and watch what happens. As they move this roller, the center mass of the system is gradually changing. You can observe as they get it going up, it's lifting, everything's good. The crane, quick question for you, okay? Now that that's off the ground, it's completely off the ground, where is the center of mass for the crane and the steamroller, that system? Where is its center mass, where must it be at this present moment? Do you know? Well, it has to be under the physical footprint of the crane itself. So the crane is sitting there, has this arm extended out, and at the end of that arm is the steamroller. The center mass must be under the body of the crane in order for it to stay up. So I don't know if you've ever seen, we had a big crane come out to help us when we were building our house to pour the concrete. They have these big spider legs that go out and spread out really far in order to increase that base of support. So anyway, that's where it is at present, but let's see what happens as they start to swing this steamroller to try to get it out of the traffic. Ooh, the suspense. I'm guessing you probably have an idea of what might happen here. But as it starts to move, the base of support stays the same, but the center of mass gradually changed as I got a little further away. And look what happened to the crane again because the center of mass was no longer over the base of support and ended up crushing that car, unfortunately. So yeah, again, center of mass must stay over the footprint of the crane, otherwise bad news. All right, so that's center of mass. The next thing I want to just briefly introduce to you is the velocity center of mass. So that's talking about the speed at which the center of mass of a system is moving. So it helps you to quantify, again, the overall motion of an object by paying attention to the velocity of its center of mass. And its equation looks almost the exact same as that of the center of mass equation, but only with velocities. So again, you can have multiple different objects that are moving. So here you see two objects, the red and the blue object move and collide and bounce off of one another. But if you notice, the velocity of the center of mass does not change in this situation, even though the two objects will collide off of one another that's something we're going to talk about in more detail as we get into understanding linear momentum. But this idea of the velocity of the center of mass will give us a direct introduction to the concept of momentum that we'll see very soon. So just a quick example problem for you about the velocity of the center of mass. Here's two figure skaters, all right? They're starting off, as you can see, stationary. I give you their relative masses, all right? And you're watching this and you just decide, oh, I wonder what happens to their velocity of the center of mass of them. If I think of the two of them as a system, what's going to happen if they push off of one another? So you get out your phone, you make a video, maybe use that tracker video analysis software I told you guys about. And you find that the first skater, the male skater here, moves backwards at a speed of about one and a half meters per second. While the other skater, the female skater, moves back at about two and a half meters per second. All right. 
what's the velocity of the center of mass before and after the collision? So pause it, try it out, see what you get. The before, I'm guessing you can figure out pretty easily, right? Before, they're not moving. V1, V2, both zero, so the velocity of the center mass is zero. What about afterwards? Well, we have their masses, we have their velocities. You plug and chug, making sure you realize since he's moving backwards, it's a negative 1.5 meters per second, and we find that the velocity of the center mass stays at approximately zero as they push off of one another. Since they're on an isolated system, <laughs> isolated, anyway, since there's no net outside forces, it's only internal, you see that the velocity of the center mass doesn't change. Interesting idea, interesting concept. It's going to come to play as we talk about more with uh, momentum. All right, so now I want to introduce the idea of momentum. What is momentum? Well, I'm guessing you've probably heard the term, you've thought about or seen uh, different applications of the idea of momentum. And you can probably figure out it depends on two quantities. It depends on the mass and velocity, right? I used to play football back in high school and so on, and the amount of momentum somebody had determined by, was determined by how fast they're going, their velocity, and their mass. As somebody who was small, I needed to try to increase my velocity in order to have the same momentum as some of those bigger guys I would go against. So momentum is mass times velocity. Notice the little vector arrow on top. That means that momentum is a vector quantity. So the direction of momentum is the same as the direction of velocity, and it has units of kilograms times meters per second. All right. Now notice we use the letter P here, lowercase p, to represent momentum. All right, M was already taken by mass, and P actually, I believe it uh, has roots tied to the Latin word that used to be used in place of momentum, um, started with a P, and so that's why they use it. All right, so now I want to look at how we change momentum. So tonight I'm actually going to play in a softball game, a slow-pitch softball game here in town. So let's, thinking about that, right, if I hit the ball, which hopefully I will and not miss, um, I'm going to change the momentum of the ball, right? It's going to have a certain mass and velocity coming towards me, and I will impact with my bat and cause it to go the other way. So I'm going to hit it, apply a force to it. The bat will be in contact with the ball for a certain period of time, and so that force in time will cause it to experience a change in momentum. So there's a new physical quantity I want to introduce to you that depends upon force and time. Now to fully understand this quantity known as impulse. You'd need calculus doing integration area under the curve kind of stuff. But since this is not calculus-based physics, we're just going to assume that there's just one constant force the whole time and just take the average. So like when I hit the baseball, it, the first instant it starts to touch the ball and bat touches the ball, it's barely impacting at all. They're very small force. As then the milliseconds go by, the bat is impacting it with more and more force until it reaches a maximum and then the ball will sort of bounce off of the bat and as it exits off the bat the force decreases again until it's no longer in contact. But instead of looking at all those changes we're just going to say alright let's act as though there's one constant average force with the bat the entire time. So impulse, sorry I has already been taken so we're going to use the letter J for impulse, and impulse is the average force multiplied by that change in time, the duration of the impact. So usually these change in times are quite small, you know, milliseconds and things for kind of day-to-day -day life applications like hitting a softball, kicking a soccer ball, that sort of thing. But if you look at our units here, we notice that we have a vector quantity of force newtons multiplied by seconds, and so we have newtons times seconds. And if you remember back, check this out. Newtons are kilograms times meters per second squared. One of those seconds cancels out. So the units for impulse, newtons times seconds, are the exact same as the units for momentum of kilograms times meters per second. All right, so again, impulse is the force multiplied by the change in time. Graphically, it's actually just the area under the force times time curve, but we're going to just deal with it in terms of an average force instead. All right, so I want to make an interesting observation here. Let's start with Newton's second law and see how we can compare momentum and impulse. Since it seems that they have similar units, I wonder what that means. So Newton's second law tells us net force equals mass times acceleration. 
Now acceleration, if we have a constant acceleration, or if we're looking at the average acceleration, is just equal to your change in velocity over your change in time, right? So we can rewrite this as force equals mass times final velocity minus mass times initial velocity over change in time. I just distributed this mass and multiplied it by each of these two velocities. Well, what is this mass times final velocity times minus mass times initial velocity? That looks an awful lot like our momentum, right? So let's multiply the change in time to the other side. And what we observe is what's known as the impulse momentum theorem, that the net force multiplied by the time over which that force is applied is equal to your change in momentum. So impulse equals change in momentum. This is a super important impulse momentum theorem, all right? It tells us, again, that if we have some force affecting an object, it will cause it to experience a change in momentum. And the impulse, the force times the time, will give you or tell you how much the momentum is going to change. Quick uh, kind of conceptual question I want you to think about. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if you've ever seen a car accident, right? I've seen a few different times where people have gone to accidents or just seen a car after an accident. It's amazing the carnage that seems to occur. You have two cars that hit one another and they both just get completely crumpled and smashed up in the front. So at first glance, when I was younger, I was like, man, cars just must be made really cheap. They're able to crumple so much. But in fact, engineers intentionally create the cars to be able to crumple at least a certain amount. I actually had a friend who one time got in an accident. Somebody turned out in front of her. She slammed into the side of him because he turned out so last minute. And her car crumpled all the way up, almost right to her knees, and then stopped and didn't crumple anymore. And she was able to walk away with minor injuries only. So my question to you all is, why? Why do engineers do that? What's the deal? Are they just cheap and they want body shops to make money? Or what? Think about momentum and impulse. Pause the video. And then let's come back and see if you figured out why they do that. All right, so hopefully you paused it. Guess what? The reason that they do that, the reason they've designed the vehicles to crumple is because of impulse and force, right? Whether anytime you have a car wreck, right, ideally you try to minimize the amount of momentum exchange that occurs. But say you have two cars that are going to hit head on, each moving at 30 miles an hour. Okay, the amount of momentum that they bring in is fixed. You can't change that. So what can you change? Well, the only thing you can change is the impulse time, right? If you cause that car wreck to occur over a longer period of time, what happens to that maximum force experienced by the people in the cars? It decreases. The longer you can make the accident occur, or the longer it takes for the two cars to exchange their momentum and slow down, as a result of their collision, the less peak force they will experience and therefore the less damage that will occur to their bodies, right? The whiplash effect is a result of high force, high acceleration. So the more you can minimize that by increasing the impulse time, the better. There's other things too. I mean, if the cars were to hit and bounce back, you would have a larger change in momentum. So you don't want that to occur, but it's about increasing that impulse time, which decreases that maximum force. So here's another kind of idea. I don't know if you've ever used to do like an egg toss or a water balloon toss. You move back further and further and further, see how far you can toss it. Anytime, well, if you do it well, if you're not one of the first people out, the way you're probably catching the balloon or the egg is by moving your hands back kind of rapidly with the balloon as you catch it. What are you doing? So multiple choices time. You're de are you uh, doing this in order to decrease the change in momentum, decrease the impulse, or decrease the force exerted by your hands. So again, pause it, think about it, what do you think? Boom. The correct answer, as you probably figured out by now, is answer C. You didn't change the momentum, right? It's going from whatever its velocity was to zero. So its change in momentum is fixed. Change of momentum equals impulse, so A and B are really just saying the same thing. The only thing you can do is increase the time that the collision is occurring and thereby decrease the force maximum exerted on the balloon to try to prevent it from breaking. Cool. So here's an example problem for you to try to use this for problem solving. So you take a ball, let's see, 0.4 kilograms. That's probably maybe something like a soccer ball. Um, I'm guessing would have a mass in that range. So say you throw or kick a soccer ball at some wall. 
It goes towards the wall at 30 meters per second, hits and bounces, let's assume it's straight back at 20 meters per second, okay? Based on that information, I want you to tell me what is the impulse on the ball during that collision as it collides with the wall. So what is its impulse from the net force that it experiences? And if you were to like have a video and this collision is a well inflated ball, happens very rapidly in just 10 milliseconds, if that's the case, what's the net force? Or sorry, not net force, the average force during that collision on the ball. Pause it, give it a go. All right, hopefully you paused it. Now let's go ahead and jump in. So we want to start by trying to find the impulse, right? And reminder, impulse equals change in momentum, which is also equal to the average force multiplied by the change in time. That's our impulse momentum theorem, right? Impulse equals change in momentum. So as we dive in for part A, we want to find the impulse. We don't know anything about the force. We do know about the time, right? So let's look at momentum. We can use momentum to find impulse since we know mass and velocity before and mass and velocity after the collision. But we're dealing with a vector quantity, right? So we need to look at momentum in the x and in the y direction separately, okay? Make sure you're breaking things down into x and y components. We're dealing with vectors once again. Luckily here, everything is just in the x direction, so that makes it a little bit easier, but soon we'll have momentum and impulse in two dimensions, and then it won't be quite so simple. So in the y direction, it's zero. There's no initial velocity, no final velocity in the y direction, piece of cake. In the x direction, however, we do have an initial and final momentum because we have initial and final velocities in the x direction. Be careful, pay close attention to sign on this, all right? So we got final velocity, which is V2x minus the initial, excuse me, final momentum, which is mass times V2x minus the initial momentum of mass times V1x. But notice, right, our final velocity is positive, but our initial velocity is negative. So we're going to have a minus a negative, which will give us a positive, which makes sense. There's more change in motion because it's going one way, stopping, turning around, and going back the other. That's a larger change in momentum than to just slow down from 30 to 40 meters per second, right? So it's a bigger change in momentum, that's why. So we take our mass, we multiply it by our change in velocity, we get our change in momentum, which is also equal to our impulse. So our impulse in the x direction is 20 newtons times seconds, or you could say 20 kilograms times meters per second, that works as well. And so our overall impulse, since it's only in the x direction, is 20 newtons times seconds directly to the right, because that's the direction in which it's changing. So that's part A. For part B, we're asked to find that average force. So we know average force is just equal to impulse divided by change in time. Again, we're dealing with a vector, so we need to break it down to x and y components, although the y component is zero. All we're left with is the x component, so our 20 newtons times seconds impulse. We divide that by 0 0.01 seconds, so we find that the average force that the ball experiences while impacting the wall is 2,000 newtons directed to the right. You see that? Now keep in mind, that's not the maximum force. In fact, the maximum would probably be larger than that, but that is the average during those 10 milliseconds, the average force that it's experiencing. Sound good? Well, boom, box worthy once again. So here's a conceptual question for you all. Let's say you're driving down the road. We used to have a car that had hail damage, so it's an applicable example for my car's past. But imagine you're driving down the road and you have raindrops falling from the sky, all right? They're hitting your car all the time. Then, a little bit later, those raindrops turn to hail. So let's assume that their uh, velocity is the same um, as they hit and the impact time, the amount of time it's in contact with your roof is about the same, and the mass of each drop of water was the same as the mass of each um, hailstone. Which one will exert a larger force on your car, or are they gonna exert the same? What do you think and why? So it's a little tricky, you're gonna have to make some assumptions, but it's good, that's the way life happens, right? Physics of everyday life right here. So think about it, pause it maybe, talk to a friend if there's somebody there, if your mom's home, you know, say, hey mom, what do you think of this, you know? Anyway, so hopefully you figured out your guess, and the answer is, at least my answer is, that the hailstones will actually generate a larger force on your car. The reason for that is they would experience or cause 
a larger change in momentum. The raindrop's going to go from whatever that initial velocity is to zero, whereas the hailstone's going to go from whatever that initial velocity is to some negative velocity or positive, some velocity in the opposite direction as it bounce, bounces back up. So since you have a larger change in velocity and the mass is the same, you have a larger overall impulse, which means a larger change in momentum and a larger force acting on your roof since the time is the same. Okay, so again, I'm making the assumption that the hailstone is going to bounce off your roof and not just splat like a raindrop does, which, if it's a hard hailstone, would be true. So tricky, tricky conception. All right, so now I want to move on, all right? In chapter 7, I started with the work energy theorem and expanded that into talking about conservation of energy at the end of chapter 7 and into chapter 8. So now we've just introduced the idea of the impulse momentum theorem, telling us that the impulse equals a change of momentum, right? And now we're going to expand that into what's known as the conservation of momentum. But I want to prove to you how this works. Okay, so in order to understand the principle of conservation of momentum, you need to first understand what I'm talking about when I say an internal force versus an external force. So any object or any system can really experience either forces from the outside, external forces, or internal forces which are within the object. So let's say the system is like my whole body, right? So if I clap my hands or hit one hand against the other, that's an internal force because it's all within my system. I'm pushing on myself as the hands hit off of one another. But if my dog were to come up and jump on me or something like that, that would be an external force. He's applying some outside force to me. Or earlier, we talked about those two ice skaters earlier in the video, right? We defined our system to encompass both of them. They're both part of our system. So as they pushed off of each other, that was an internal force to the system. But if they experienced friction or something like that, that would be an external force. So internal forces are within the system between different parts of your system. External forces are from something outside. Another example might be, say you're playing pool, billiards, all right? So you have all of your billiards balls and the cue ball. If you define that as your system, as they bounce off of one another, those would all be internal forces. But as any of them hit the sides or fall into the pocket, that would be an external force coming from something outside. All right? So we have the principle of impulse equals change in momentum, right? So I want to apply this now to a system. Let's say our system just involves any two objects, all right? So they can have internal forces between one another. And Newton's first law, or sorry, Newton's third law tells us for each force internally, you're going to have an equal and opposite force. So that's why you have F12 and F21. So let's say we look at the first object, the green object. Its net force is going to be any external force it experiences plus any internal forces, right? It's obvious. Net force is all the forces outside and inside. Times time equals change in momentum. Same thing for the second object. You have any external forces times time, or sorry, plus internal forces times time equals change in momentum for the second object. All right? So those are our two objects. Now, if we wanted to look at the overall system, we add those together. So the, everything experienced by the first object, it's impulse and momentum, plus the impulse momentum for the second object to look at the system as a whole. If we add those together, we get one big, long, ugly equation. And because of Newton's third law of motion, these two internal forces are equal and opposite to one another. Therefore, boom, we can cancel them out. So what we find then is that the final momentum for the whole system minus, oh, minus the initial momentum of the entire system is just equal to only external forces times change in time. So since internal forces cancel out, what we're left with is only external forces can affect the momentum of a system. So when we saw those two figure skaters, even though there was an internal force as they pushed off of one another, the total velocity of the center mass of the system stayed the same. The total momentum of the system stayed the same because it's only external forces that can change the momentum of the system. 
So again, it's only the sum of external forces times time that give us a change of momentum. So what does this mean? Well, what this means is if you can create a system that is free of external forces that have zero net external force, what we define as an isolated system, isolated meaning it's free of any external forces, if you have an isolated system, then your momentum will be conserved. If you are in an isolated system free of any external forces, you will have conservation of momentum. But keep in mind, it's only in an isolated system. All right, people get confused by this sometimes. Okay, so for example, if you have a car driving down the road and it hits, you know, runs into a wall or something like that, is momentum conserved? No, right? Even if you define your system as the object and the wall, they hit, it hits it, momentum's lost because the wall is attached to the ground. And so there's an external force from the ground on that wall causing it to lose momentum. But if you're doing bumper cars or like air hockey or something like that, your objects are just bouncing off of each other in an isolated way. In that case, you have conservation of momentum. So we're going to do a series of different problems using the idea of conservation of momentum. Um, something like bowling is a good example of conservation of momentum. The ball has a certain amount of momentum, it then hits one pin, transfers some of its momentum, sending that pin flying. It can hit another one, transferring momentum. And so the momentum that the ball started with is just being spread out amongst all these different parts of the system, but the overall momentum of the system stays the same until things start hitting the back of the bowling alley. So we're going to be trying to work with conservation of momentum. So always, always, you must first figure out whether or not you have an isolated system. So you need to define what objects are in your system. You need to then look at what forces are acting on your system determine whether they're internal or external, and only if you realize or verify that all forces are internal and there's zero external forces, if that's the case, then you can assume you have an isolated system, and from there, you can do some of the momentum initial, add all those together, and set it equal to the sum or the adding up of all final momentum, set those two equal to one another and solve, keeping in mind that you're dealing with a vector quantity, so you must do the x and the y together. So I'm going to do some sample problems of this. Um, this video is getting a little long, so I'm just going to do one short example for you all here, and then I'll do some longer, more complicated examples in separate videos for you to see. So imagine somebody decides to do a test. So guns, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but they recoil quite a bit. I had a friend who one time uh, had a was learning how to shoot and go hunting and different things, and he shot a rifle and the recoil kicked back. He wasn't ready for it, he wasn't supporting it properly, and the scope actually hit him and he came to work with a black eye the next day, sadly. Know your physics or else bad news. So here's someone who decides to just hold a rifle loosely. Maybe they're doing this in a lab in a safe way and they're gonna fire it, and the bullet's gonna shoot out one side and the gun is gonna recoil as a result. And so he wants to calculate to predict what the recoil is going to be and then see whether or not experiment verifies his prediction. So let's say that the overall rifle has a mass of like 3 kilograms and the bullet being fired is 0 0.05 kilograms, so 50 grams. It's kind of a small bullet. Realistically, it'd probably be a little more massive than that, but we'll go with that. And so let's say that this rifle can shoot the bullet at a speed of about 300 meters per second. What is the recoil velocity of the rifle? So we're going to Try to solve this problem. We're going to assume it's hanging loosely. It's free of external forces. So we have an isolated system. All right. So here's our bullet. It's going to shoot forward with some momentum. The gun's going to move backwards with some recoil momentum as well. And we want to try to solve. So the first question is, thinking about our momentum, right, conservation of momentum, what's our initial momentum and what's our final momentum? Pause the video. Think about it. See if you can solve and get an answer. Okay, so hopefully you did, and guess what? In this situation, the final momentum is the momentum of the gun plus the momentum of the bullet. And the initial momentum is zero because they're both stationary. When you first pull the trigger, they're both stationary. So this is interesting, right? Momentum here is gonna be conserved. What about energy? Is energy gonna be conserved? Well, not mechanical energy, right? Because the initial energy is zero, and then there's obviously both things have energy afterwards. Do we just magically make up energy? No, right? It was stored in the form of chemical potential energy in the gunpowder that was ignited. 
So that's where the energy came from. But we can use conservation of momentum. So this is one of the powers of conservation of momentum when sometimes energy will not suffice. All right, so the momentum of the gun and the bullet, as we can see, must be equal and opposite to one another since the system started with zero initial momentum. So momentum is just mass times velocity for the bullet and for the gun. So here we can see the momentums are going to be equal and opposite to one another. We want to find the final velocity of this gun, right? So if we do algebra and solve for the velocity of the gun, we find that it's negative 5 meters per second. Now, where did this negative come from? Well, the negative came from the fact that it's shooting backwards in the opposite direction that the bullet was shot. So again, just make sure you pay close attention to the process. It's an isolated system. You establish that. You then set up final momentum equals initial momentum. Figure out what your final momentum components are, what your initial momentum is, and then solve. Now, notice here, Everything was in the x direction, so I didn't have to break things down into vectors. If you have things moving in multiple directions at once, you'll then have to use vectors. All right, so I think this video is pretty long at this point, so I'm going to stop here. I'll have some other examples for you guys um, in separate videos to look at more complex ones, and then tune in for the second half of Chapter 9 where we talk about uh, inelastic collisions, elastic collisions, and looking at momentum in two dimensions. Have a box-worthy day.